So, thank you very much. If you can take your seat, we are just starting the next session. Uh, I'm Giacomo Mazzone, I'm the co-chair of the PNMA, that means Policy Network for Meaningful Access, uh, with uh, Nima Luganjira, that unfortunately she cannot be with us because the concomitant engagement uh, in Morocco, so she cannot be at two places at the same time yet. Um, thank you for being with us. The topic, uh, as you can imagine, is complex, and uh, we will have multiple voices to, uh, to go through it. Just to resume in a few words uh, what we'll be about, um, the concept of meaningful access has been defined um, in various ways, let's say, during the years, but we have some consolidate, uh, ah, the last speaker arrives. <laughs> Uh, we have a consolidated literature about that, and um, I've seen with pleasure that has been treated in many other workshops and discussions across the old IGF. So uh, what we will try to do is to try to bring into the discuss, uh, discussion of this afternoon uh, the richness of the debate that has been going around uh, at the IGF and, of course, uh, across the globe. This is why we have a uh, distinguished list of panelists with us that will try to represent the richness of the debate. I start from the extreme right, not politically meaningful, uh, that is Roberto Zambrana with us, that is the remote moderation, and I thank him for having accepted to be with us. Then uh, after him, there is our friend uh, Keisuke Kamimura, I hope I'm not pronouncing too bad, it's okay. Good. from uh, the Daito Bunkao University, representing the Japanese IGF. Um, then we have Paolo Lanteri from WIPO. Then we have, from the ITU, um, we have uh, ah, Martin Schaper, that is in charge of the statistics, and we, he will explain us how important are the statistics for the debate. And then we have Onika Nonlala, Makwawa, but you will say better than me later, <laughs> that uh, pro Global in Digital Inclusion Partnership. We have Laurent Ferrelli from ICANN, and we have uh, Maria Bradefer from IFLA. So, uh, I would not to waste so much time with the presentation, but I will go straight in, in the medias res, as the Latin said. Um, we will start with a contrib video contribution from Vint Cerf, the, uh, that not only is the chair of the leadership panel, but is also uh, one of the member of the group of PNMA. And uh, last year he was with us in presence at this same panel. This year he cannot, but he um, was um, able to send a very short contribution. The contribution of uh, Vint is linked to the, the points that we discussed last year with him. That one was about the, um, uh, the problem of the, one of the reasons for the difficulty of access and the meaningful access is the affordability of the devices. Uh, and the second is, um, the second question to be related to the main topic of this year, IGF, is if the arrival AI uh, in a massive way could, uh, could be improving uh, and help to solving the problem of uh, accessibility and meaningful accessibility. So if the control room can start the video, we can see self contribution about, um, accessible uh, systems we have to take into account economics and so affordable systems are important if you can't afford the devices equipment and service it gives you access to a meaningful and useful internet then you don't get to use it so we need to drive cost out by a number of ways it could be making things less expensive it could be subsidizing people whose incomes are inadequate but who deserve access to internet and all of its services so here we have some creative thinking that uh, is needed in order to make things affordable to the general population. Meaningful access to the artificial intelligence means understanding something about the way in which uh, it works. And as an example, one of my uh, friends and colleagues, Judah Pearl at UCLA, has written books on causality 
and another book called The Book of Why, W-H-Y. This is about understanding how these large language models and large machine learning models actually work. And understanding that without a causal model, all you have is probability and correlation. But correlation and causality are not the same thing. So using these tools requires you to think about causality as you apply the output to conclusions. Well, as a TV journalist, this confirmed me my doubts about uh, shooting videos with iPhone. It's not the same than shooting with a professional camera, but <laughs> well, at least these are the results. Prejudice? Could be. Um, so, I, do, I hope that you followed what Vint was saying through the uh, subtitles. The, uh, uh, and his contribution is quite interesting because linked to, to what we said last year. So this is the first contribution for our debate. But go back, going back to the mainstream debate, uh, the, uh, we have now uh, Onika that will start first and will talk about the, some experience that um, she is following and, and some report, interesting reports about meaningful access, please. Great, thank you. Um, I will just get to it. So one of the ways in which we, we actually define uh, someone who has meaningful access uh, is a person who has adequate speed to connect, uh, a person who has a, a smart device like a smartphone as a, a minimum uh, entry point, and has the ability to access the internet on a daily basis if that's what they, they choose to as well as has uh, access to unlimited data. And uh, the research that we've done actually shows that uh, we need to recalibrate how we are defining uh, access in, in general if we want to focus on meaningful access to make sure that people have the, the right device to be able to connect as well as uh, the right speed uh, and the unlimited uh, access to data. The experience that we've seen is that uh, the people who actually have meaningful connectivity, those users are more likely to be able to use their access for things that can truly help improve their lives, such as looking for a job, taking a course, uh, looking uh, at, at health and wellness information, as opposed to those who have just a basic access uh, to connectivity. But one of the great challenges we need to address is the access to affordable devices, amongst all the others, but access to affordable devices uh, remains one of the greater challenges for people to be meaningfully connected. Uh, at the moment, uh, especially in the low and middle income countries, uh, we are still seeing entry level smartphones at 20 to 25% average month household income, which is extremely unaffordable, especially for those on the lower income uh, quantiles uh, in, in those countries. So I'll just pause there for now and um, you know engage later on this. But just driving the issue of affordability to access as well as affordability to the devices. Yeah, that was exactly one of the points raised by Vint Cerf in his introduction. Thank you, Onika, uh, and thank you for saying in the time. Um, we are in, in Japan uh, for the first time for the IGF, uh, and Japan is one of the few countries in, that has hosted the, the um, IGF that has a language that is not Latin language. The previous one we had was um, in Egypt in Arabic. So the question is, being in a country like this, is the fact that not to be Latin character language a barrier, and how this affect the access and the meaningful access for the Japanese citizens? Hi, my name is Keisuke Kamimura. Thank you very much for inv inviting me on this panel. I am Professor of Linguistics and Japanese at Daito Bunka University in Tokyo. So I have a somewhat linguistic perspective on this issue. So let me uh, share my personal uh, reflection and observation with you. Um, uh, I'm a bit concerned whether what I am talking, what I am going to talk about fits this panel well, but let me try. 
So as, you, as Giacomo mentioned, we use a combination of scripts in writing Japanese. Uh, and how did this affect the access to the internet in Japan? Maybe there are, there are two aspects, aspects, to, aspects to this issue. Uh, one is technical, and the other is social and cultural. But let me focus on the first one uh, here, uh, technical aspect. Uh, we once had technical problems in enabling with Japanese characters on computer systems and internet applications. I remember computer systems and my computer and applications did not process the Japanese language in the way it should uh, when, I was, when, when I was a st student, particularly. Um, and even if your computer is ready for dealing with the characters, uh, your ap application programs like uh, word processing software or whatever uh, may not handle the language uh, effectively. So uh, you can't write papers, uh, so you, you, you can't use spelling, spell checkers or other uh, correction functionalities for uh, Japanese if the language was not, is not supported. And I also remember email message, messages in Japanese uh, often, were often broken on the way of transmission and web pages in Japanese were often rendered to what we call gibberish or mojibake in Japanese. So we surely had many troubles in dealing with Japanese characters at the technical level, at an early stage of the personal computer and the internet, but many of these technical problems were eventually sorted out by the efforts of various commercial and non-commercial developers. But well, that was done before the internet became available to the wider population. So I wouldn't say we had no problems, but they did not remain too long. So the trouble with characters and languages was quite annoying, but uh, it was not uh, prohibitive to the extent that it blocked out the Japanese from accessing the internet effectively. But if you look at things differently, ordinary users in Japan uh, were confident enough to use their language on the internet because technical issues had been resolved before they turned to the use of the internet. So um, if we had not had the Japanese capability in computer and the applications of internet, uh, many, many of us in Japan may have been hesitant to use uh, the internet uh, as we use it now. So um, we sorted out the, uh, we did have problems, but we sorted out uh, well before the internet came. But uh, <clears throat> if, um, if you, you are facing the trouble now, it's going to be a very big issue. So. Thank you very much. That's um, a very, uh, real witness of what can happen in these countries. Uh, but I'm glad to, see, to understand that is the context that is also important, because the fact that you are in a country where uh, you are affluent, you have the tools, you can afford the, the right devices and the right software, this diminish the impact of the uh, risk of being excluded, of course. The, the, this is not the case in other country where this, the same condition doesn't are not gathered. Okay, so if we are lucky now, we have a, a remote participant with us, um, and is a representative of the government. This uh, Stephen Maita Nahao, that is secretary for the new Papua New Guinea Department of Information Communication Technology. Uh, he is connected on, on remote and. Um, he, won't, uh, he will explain us some experience that they are doing uh, with the assistance of some experts, uh, Judith is with us in the room, uh, that are trying to help uh, Papua New Guinea to uh, go ahead and try to minimize the exclusion of the citizen from the internet um, revolution. 
Please, Mr. Maitanao, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Uh, uh, good evening all the way from Papua New Guinea, uh, Port Mosby. Uh, it's uh, great to be here uh, online and to be participating in the IGF. Uh, I just have a few comments uh, and, of course, my experience and professional experience and insights will generally be, be from the journey that Papua New Guinea is uh, facing. For those not aware, Papua New Guinea is, a, uh, is an island nation uh, consisting of multiple islands and one mainland in the South Pacific, uh, uh, north of Australia and uh, east of, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, sharing land mass with Indonesia. We're roughly around 11.87 million people. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Papua New Guinea holds about 12% 12, 12 of the world's language, and that's roughly around 846 languages uh, actively spoken. And uh, you, would, you would think that this would be a challenge uh, in terms of inclusivity, um, but uh, I, I'd like to just briefly speak on on um, on uh, meaningful connectivity and what that means to Papua New Guinea. Uh, we've had uh, connectivity as a government priority since uh, early 2000, 2003, when mobile network, uh, uh, our first state on mobile network operator was introduced. And uh, later through the introduction of competition, uh, which was uh, in 2009. And uh, something interesting is that since, since 2009 and within that 10 year span, uh, an interesting insight indicated was that the most searched and accessed sites in Papua New Guinea uh, from that 10 year period commencing 2009 were three websites. Uh, uh, the first website is uh, bsp.com and for those uh, around the world not aware bsp is one of our main banks in papua new guinea bank of south pacific the second most accessed website was nrl.com nrl is uh, uh, the national rugby league in australia and uh, uh, papua new guineans are very uh, uh, very avid fans of rugby and the third most popular website was facebook now these tells, these, this was consistent for over 10, 10 years. And uh, it tells you a lot of things, but one of the things that the government took out of this was that, you know, why, why are we not accessing, you know, uh, there's a lot of information out there on the internet. There's a lot of services get, that can add value to uh, the people's productivity, that can add value to uh, the livelihood of our people. Why are they not accessing it? What is government not doing to provide those, uh, make it easy or inform our people or, or, or better yet provide services that would be made online? And this is one of, out of that, you know, uh, you know, our meaning of meaningful connectivity is about having connectivity with a purpose. You know, uh, citizens that can have access and add value to their livelihood add value to the productivity of the country. And this is where in 2009, we started to look at how can we shift, how can government shift from a connectivity sort of traditional, I'll use the word traditional connectivity model where we were focused on expanding our infrastructure. How can we shift that so that it's about being service driven and purpose driven. And so we introduced the digital transformation policy in 2020. We started working on that and this followed by a Digital Government Act in 2022 and followed by a Digital Government Plan 2023 to 2027. What we essentially did was we shifted and we said, okay, let's not talk about connectivity. Let's talk about bringing, let government be the leader in bringing meaningful services, digital government services to the people, putting citizens first, making services fast, simple and clear and driving that demand to connect. So we shifted that, and this is where we are. Uh, we, we're working in 2023 onwards to roll out a wide range of digital services. And I think that's, that's from my perspective and Papua New Guinea's perspective that, that we've shifted from connectivity to, to a sort of a, what we are saying, demand-driven and service-driven. And, and for us, that's, 
that's that's our approach towards uh, meaningful connect connectivity. Now, there's so much to touch on in terms of uh, our culture and diversity and how we are how we are addressing all those issues. But uh, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, I see that uh, you put the rugby uh, as one of the fundamental rights of the citizen and. Uh, for, for Italy, that is not a rugby nation, <laughs> but, but I, can, I can understand. For us, it would be football eventually. Thank you very much. I hope that you can stay with us because um, we have other questions for you in the second round. Um, but um, now I would give the floor to uh, a specific section of this debate, that is the section dedicated to international organizations because we believe that uh, the international organizations are playing a special role in um, creating or supporting best practices, nurturing them and making um, available to uh, in other countries. We will start from uh, IFLA, that is the Association of the Librarians. Maria Bradefer is with us, uh, and I leave the floor to her for explaining some of these best practice cases. Thank you. Thank you, Giacomo, and also thank you for the invitation to this panel. Uh, well, I think first of all, before discussing the case of libraries, it is also important to talk about what meaningful access means in the context of libraries. And so in this sense, I would really like to say that I think it is very important to take into account that libraries have been and are still in constant development. So I think in 2023, they really shouldn't be seen as spaces for books or archives, but more as spaces that have really adapted to the technological developments of today and also uh, as spaces uh, that have an ultimate purpose of serving their local communities. Uh, so also for this, I think it is also important to notice that libraries can be a door of access uh, for those who need it most uh, yeah, for those who need most to access meaningful information, uh, but also for those who are most affected by the digital device. So I guess in a way you could also say that libraries could be seen as a multi-purpose infrastructure that serves to uh, access and provide uh, needs to local communities, uh, but also that has a lot to offer in terms of meaningful access. And so for now, I would like to discuss two cases with you briefly. So one of those cases is the case of the GLN, so the Gigabit Libraries Network. And this is a case that is going to be introduced by my colleague Don Means, who is at the audience and who is also the founder of this initiative. And the second case uh, is the case of digital skills at your local library project. That was a case that was an initiative implemented in Uganda. So it was an initiative that was originally funded by the Uganda Communications Commission, uh, but also it was expanded in 2021 via the Enable Development Agency. So in the sense this strategy started, uh, it had an objective of uh, giving extra infrastructure to public and community libraries and to also equip them across the country uh, with computers, with internet connection, but also with other facilities for community use. So that was the, the first phase of the project. And then the second phase of that initiative was a training of trainers. So a strategy for a training of trainers for local librarians uh, was implemented. And this was a very important phase of the project, actually, because it really allowed to, to localize the, the training to the, yeah, and also to adapt it to the local needs of the community. Because even though the needs were similar across the country, the, of course, every community has particular, particular needs. Uh, and then shortly after that, there was an outreach campaign that was done, and it also started in 2014. And this was actually an outreach campaign that was launched by the librarians who had been trained by the training of trainers. And that uh, outreach campaign was done to reach uh, the community in general, but also a lot of people who wanted to access skills to improve their businesses and also to access education. And so right after that outreach campaign start, 
uh, a lot of people were trained. So, so far in terms of results, uh, about 14,000 people have been trained across Uganda and a lot of them have uh, reported that they have started initiatives with small and medium enterprises. Uh, at least 200 people of those 14,000 have uh, reported uh, good results after they received the digital skills training and a lot of people have also used the training they received to access higher education in, in other places. So I think in this sense uh, that gives a lot of context about why libraries are important uh, in terms of meaningful connectivity. And there I would also like to, to talk a little bit about the GLN uh, initiative. So for this, I would like to give the floor to my colleague Don Means, who is at the audience. Please don't come to the mic over there. Thank you, Maria. Uh, the point made about uh, uh, the role of libraries as aggregators of ICT resources in a community is extremely relevant when we're talking about uh, meaningful uh, access uh, because it's unique in that regard. Uh, our, our group, the Gigabit Libraries Network, is an open consortium of innovating libraries using emerging telecom technology to expand internet inclusion, as well as to increase community resilience against disasters and outages. We've begun, de we've begun deploying uh, low Earth orbit satellite connectivity kits in libraries in Africa, starting in Nigeria. Our position is that every community should have at least a single point of no fee, low fee internet access, like a library, and it should be resilient against outages. The point is made by esteemed climate activist Bill McKibben. I think connecting, he says, I think connecting libraries as a community access hubs for resilience is a good idea and highly relevant. These communities may not be contributing huge amounts of carbon, but they're the places where it's growing fastest, and more to the point, they're where people are suffering most the effects. We seek advice and guidance on this implementation and this exploration. A single LEO unit needing only about a light bulb worth of energy can be operated uh, for around $50 to $100 a month in, in developing markets as this whole area, these whole systems are, are just arriving and developing themselves. A single unit can provide impervious 100 megabit connection uh, to places suffering from disastrous weather, which would otherwise be entirely cut off from outside information communities. We work through national libraries in each country to implement these plans. We are not agents of any company or enterprise. We wish only to help people in the highest risk with the least resources to cope with the terrible challenges of, of climate-driven disasters. Perhaps a useful policy environment to support this can be found within the uh, UN COP28 declaration on adaptation. This is the point that, yes, mitigation is critical, but it's really late. It's too late to reverse uh, the changes that we're experiencing today and will continue to experience. So the strategy of adapting to these changes is commonsensical, and having this kind of a resource in every community is doable. It's, it's entirely affordable, and the, and the benefit besides increasing just the normal services that people can have through the internet to this resilience factor we think is uh, really worth exploring. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, a question from, for you, because you, this project is one of the oldest um, trying to improve um, the characteristic of the librarians uh, and in the field of meaningful access. Uh, which kind of policies would be needed in order to strengthen, to make more effective uh, what are you doing? Because we, as policy network, what we are looking for policies that could be the most effective in making happen this everywhere. Well, certainly the, the policy of uh, the, uh, the rights of access are, are key to this. The policy framework that I mentioned within the context of the UN's uh, allocation or pledge 
of uh, tens of billions of dollars to address climate adaptation would cover uh, a lot of uh, connectivity. And uh, so advocating on behalf of that approach, I think, would be a very direct way to go about this. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, we have seen the uh, IFLA um, contribution, uh, and now we go to another more structured, uh, more official agency of the United Nations, that is the ITU. But um, the ITU, uh, I asked them, bring us some best practice cases, and they say, no, we can do better for you. <laughs> and they send me, <laughs> Uh, Martin Sharp. Why? <clears throat> because um, the explanation was that um, for them, and I agree with them, the, the statistics are an important tool. If you want to make appropriate policies, you need proper statistics and data. And uh, Martin is exactly what he's doing. And ITU is working already since a couple of years on indicators about meaningful access. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yes, indeed I can. Thank you very much. Um, coming from the ITU Data and Analytics Division, I think it's quite obvious that uh, I think it's very important, the role of data and statistics for, for meaningful access. Uh, you may have seen uh, the, the latest internet use data that we released uh, about a month, a month and a half ago, that says that 5.4 billion people are online, but 2.6 billion are still offline. That means that 67% of the world population uh, is connected to the internet. Uh, yet 95% has access to some kind of mobile broadband signal. So that this already is a clear indication uh, about uh, missing people, that there is a, a big usage gap. But even among the people that are connected, uh, not all of them are in a meaningful way connected. There may be issues with quality of the infrastructure, with the cost, they maybe have, don't have the, enough data to go online as often as they want, and so on and so on. It was already raised in, in the first intervention as well. Uh, so two years ago, we launched a uh, set of targets together with the UN Office of the, the Tech Envoy, uh, a set of targets on what we call universal and meaningful connectivity. This was in the framework of the Digital Cooperation Roadmap of the UN Secretary General. It has now uh, become a project with, uh, with the EU, with funding from the EU. So we have a set of targets that we're now going to put into practice and, uh, and try to disseminate uh, among policymakers in the world. So basically what we're doing is we're coupling the data and the statistics to the policy perspective. Now in, in our set of targets, it's a set of targets on uh, people uh, using the internet, but also the quality of the internet connection. We have a set of targets on um, the cost of, of an internet package, of the skills needed, uh, and so on. And this is important because if our goal is to achieve universal and meaningful connectivity by the year 2030, which is very ambitious, and we know that, uh, you need to know where you are, and from there on, you need to, uh, you can go on a path into reaching targets so you know where you need to go. But how to get there? You need to know where you are, and you need to also see that the actions you're taking are actually leading you to where you want to go. So you need to constantly monitor as well your policy actions. So these targets. They, they go into two directions. We have a set of targets on uh, universal access, which means that we want everyone to use the internet, and everyone means all people, but also businesses, schools, uh, communities, and we want to do that in a meaningful way. And for that, we have five enablers, uh, infrastructure, affordability, skills, uh, device, and safety and security. And, and on, on Almost all of these aspects we have uh, indicators and uh, targets. Uh, we already have created a dashboard, the UMC dashboard, which you can find online uh, on the ITU website. And in the dashboard you can take any target that we have and you can see for that target 
um, where are all the countries? Where's my country, but where's my country in respect to all the other countries as well? Or you can take a country of your interest and you can see, okay, this is my country, and uh, these are the targets, and uh, on some targets we've achieved universal connectivity, uh, but on others we're actually far away from it or even at the start, or for some indicators we don't even have the data. And, and that's all information that needs to uh, channel into the policy perspective. And, and, and another very important point of the data is that you can break down the data by socioeconomic groups. So you can have a look at the digital divides. So we all know that uh, there's, a di there's a gender digital divide. So more men are using the internet than women. But how big is the divide in my country? And how does this change into uh, if, you, if you move uh, along the, the globe in, into other countries? We know that. Uh, Younger people are more avid users of the internet than older people, but how bad is it in my country? Do we need to have special uh, policy objectives to connect our senior citizens to the internet? Uh, there's also a difference between urban and rural areas. Now, is that because the infrastructure is not good enough in rural areas, or is it for other reasons? And, and, and the data can tell you uh, to a large extent uh, how that is, where it is, and especially where the gaps are, where we need to do the policies, where we have to set policies, and then over time monitor and see if our actions actually are leading to an improvement or not. So that is the product we're having. That's the good news. There's also bad news, but I'll keep that for maybe my next intervention. Thank you very much. Uh, that's very interesting. There are other points that um, we need to dig with you. but. Um, I think that this could be a very interesting source of information for everybody that want to deal with this kind of information. Laurent, uh, is now your turn as I can, and especially your project Digital Africa, I guess. Uh, what are you doing in the field of making better condition for meaningful access? And by the way, you use the data of uh, ITU or? Not, not yet. Not yet. So, <laughs> what, what we want to do but, here but is to increase the, <laughs> in, the exchange <laughs> in order not to repeat the same problems. Yeah, and and you, know, you maybe know that ITU is part of this coalition for Digital Africa, so it, may, it would make things easier, I think. So, uh, thank you very thank much, you. Giacomo, for, the, uh, for this invitation. Um, um, uh, yeah, I, I will report about what we, what we did for the last 10 months with this coalition for Digital Africa. I mean, we launched this coalition uh, during the last IGF in Addis Ababa with ITU, the uh, um, Association of African Universities, uh, the, uh, the African Association of, uh, the Association of African CCTLDs, and uh, yeah, among others. Now we have something like 11 partners. Uh, we have currently seven flagship projects, and of course, all of these projects, I mean, the, the aim of all of these projects is to uh, develop a meaningful connectivity, meaningful access in Africa. Uh, the, the, the first one, I mean, not the first one, but one which is very important for me uh, is the support we are providing to African cont country code top level domain registries, because uh, we had this week a lot of discussion about infrastructure in different um, workshop sessions, but I mean I think that there is a missing part in the discussion, which is the 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 CCTLDs, and um, <clears throat> and I don't know an example of a successful. Um, country in terms of ego of services and national digital economy, which is not able to rely on a good CCTLD registry. It's a very important part of the, of the national infrastructure and the missing part of the, main dis of the discussion we are used to have about infrastructure in, uh, in Africa. So we are providing this support uh, with uh, different partners. <clears throat> the idea is to help uh, to, to provide a kind of, um, uh, I mean, I can do that for many years, but just from a technical perspective, so we are providing technical capacity building support 
uh, to different CCTLDs, but um, it was clear for us that we need to have a more holistic approach and work with different partners in order to be able to provide more than technical um, expertise and technical capacity building support. And um, so we are helping 10 CCTLDs, that's one project. Uh, another one is uh, access to local content. I mean, of course, ICANN is not dealing with content, but you maybe know that we have international domain names and we have an issue with the use uh, of, of these uh, IDNs. Uh, this is the universal acceptance um, issue. We need to be sure that people will be able to have access to these international domain names. Another project which is important for me as well is, the, um, um, is what we are doing in terms of quality of service and cybersecurity. We have two projects. Um, um, we are um, deploying uh, some um, um, I can manage what server um, um, uh, facilities in Africa uh, and we are helping um, CCTLs in Africa to uh, better, uh, better um, protect their infrastructure, their infrastructure. And, um, and, and keep, thing keep, as well. keep something for the next Sorry? Round. Keep something for the next. If you tell us everything now, then what you say later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah, you. So I can, I can stop now and um, go back later. <laughs> Thank you. Now, um, you mentioned contents. That is not your um, specialization, but access to contents is important. And this gives me the, uh, the right angle to bring the discussion to WIPO, that, because WIPO is dealing exactly with contents. Uh, can you tell us what are you doing in this field, uh, Paolo? Absolutely. Thank Thanks you. a lot. I, it's definitely a pleasure to, to jump in the discussion from a very different perspective here. Very happy to uh, bring on to the floor the perspective of the World Intellectual Property Organization that uh, has seen uh, this discussion on meaningful access as intrinsically linked to actually the creation and the distribution of meaningful content uh, of different nature, um, educational, news reporting, or pure entertainment, like uh, music, video games, and audiovisual. Content is meaningful if it's relevant, uh, for instance, uh, in terms of cultural identity, accessible, for instance, because you can read the language, and inclusive. WIPO participated uh, and contributed uh, to this debate for many years, providing an assessment as to why any policy that has as objective uh, providing meaningful access should also keep an eye on what is be behind that, making sure the, con the compelling content we all want to enjoy is continued to be created and distributed in a sustainable way at the same time also providing certain flexibilities. This is a key aspect uh, because uh, without the content we want, uh, I think it's very hard to, to conceive uh, any meaningful access. Um, following the, the, the instruction from our facilitators, I'll skip all that part about uh, the incentives provided by IP to creation of content and the flexibilities it provides to facilitate, for instance, certain fair uses, open access, and many, many things that are enriching uh, our lives. And I'll focus only on projects, successful examples that we have uh, in place, and particularly on those that have already been reported in this framework as facilitating meaningful access. So we lead really many cross-cutting uh, initiatives in this space, so it's very hard to cluster them uh, in clear-cut categories. For ease of presenting them, I divided in two big, broad, rough groups. One are initiatives directly relevant to inclusion. The first, possibly the best example of something effective with concrete results is the Accessible Books Consortium. The Accessible Books Consortium called ABC is a public-private partnership led by WIPO and counting with the participation of many partners, including IFLA, of course, and organizations representing the blind community, the World Blind Union. The ABC goal is only one, to increase the number of books in accessible formats, such as digital braille, EPUB, audiobooks, and to distribute them 
to the people they need, that they need around the globe. We do that through a variety of lines of work, including capacity building, of course, advocacy for inclusive publishing, but the most impactful activity we do is the ABC Global Book Service, which offers an online catalog of books in accessible formats available at no cost to authorized entities serving the blind around the world. The service has nowadays more than 800,000 titles in 80 languages available for cross-border exchange without the need for clearance, any formalities related to copyright. Of the 127 access, um, authorized entities uh, that have joined the, the consortium, 70 are located in developing and least developed countries. And just in 2022, this meant that 140,000 accessible books were distributed to individuals around the globe. Then we have a beautiful story to tell about open access. We, WIPO, lead a working group formed by over 100 individuals from, un, from over 25 international organizations, many of them represented in this room. The membership is, is constantly growing. What do we do? We facilitate the debate and exchange of group practices among IGOs on how to make our content accessible and moving open access. Few, WIPO and few other IGOs now went uh, ahead and launch new collaboration with Wikimedia, for instance. We have in-house Wikimedia basically releasing all we produce through their global platform, boosting accessibility, of course, but also the possibility for any third parties to translate the content to local languages and to adapt it to any need they may have at the local level. That's one part of the story. The other part of the story, very important, is what do we do to assure that we promote production and distribution of local meaningful content, okay? Traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions are a big part of our work. WIPO's work in this field is growing stronger than ever. On top of the policy and norm setting activity, we, have, we lead and support practical initiatives such as digitization projects of uh, traditional knowledge and, uh, and folklore, mentoring, <coughs> fellowships, awards, hackathons, all sorts of stuff. And then we have more our core uh, creative industries initiatives in the context of the development agenda. Uh, for instance, uh, we, we are about to relaunch doubling the funding uh, of uh, the AV market, audiovisual market in, of Latin American production. We also recently launched specific tools for sectors like uh, digital publishing for small publishers in LDCs, or like we heard uh, these days uh, with the, the manga creators, a training tool for animation professionals in developing countries. So while the details of all this stop um, report uh, project will be submitted in writing, basically we can say that the progress on all these initiatives is steady and positive, and more importantly, the appetite of our constituency, both governments and stakeholders, is either strong or very strong. Thank you very much, Paolo. Very useful, interesting. And you mentioned that there are funding for audiovisual in um, Latin America, but unfortunately, the next experience we are talking is in Africa. Do you have funding for African <laughs> experience? Not yet, but we can uh, work okay. on it. <laughs> so this could be one of the recommendation we will take out from the conversation of today. Uh, do we have online uh, Meme and Nana Kaga McPherson? No? Ah, connection issues, access problem. <laughs> Bertrand, then can you explain to us what, uh, what is this, this experience from Uganda that uh, you yeah, recommended you. us? I'm Bertrand Moulier. Um, I feel a bit desolate that Meme and Nana are not there to explain what they do. Um, they would do so with far more charisma and um, passion than I'd be able to, to master, but I'll do my best. So Memi and Nana Kaga are two um, recovering civil engineers who have decided to um, change career um, a few years ago and became audiovisual producers in Kampala, in Uganda. And they've been trying to run a company which is entirely female-led, so they're the two directors and the entire staff is female. 
and uh, making local content for uh, local audiences in um, culturally relevant uh, languages, including Uganda, which is spoken by 5.6 million people locally as primary language, and another 5.4 are fully conversant with it. Um, and their contention and ours as well is that the ability for companies like theirs, which is by the way called Savannah Moon, uh, to actually survive and thrive in the audiovisual marketplace is an essential component of meaningful access. Once you've accessed the broadband infrastructure, you need meaningful content that reflects your lives, your preoccupations, your cultural themes, and by making fiction drama, uh, either through feature unit, unitary feature films or through television series, they're doing just that. Um, they have found that although their market has increased a little bit in the last few years, they are hobbled sometimes by a few factors. One of them is that the broadband infrastructure uh, where they live is still tentative. Uh, at times they find there's uh, unexplained bandwidth uh, throttling for technical reasons, so you're losing signals, which makes it uncomfortable to take in relevant audiovisual content. And uh, there's also, in, from their perspective, they wanted me to reflect this, a pricing issue. Uh, if, you're, you, if you're buying AG's worth of data, uh, by the time you've run through two episodes of the television series on, on the mobile telephony network, which is the way most people locally take in their content, you will find that you've almost run out of, of, uh, of um, capacity, so you'll need to purchase some more, and uh, there is not necessarily an adequation between local spending power and the ability to enjoy and access the content. More, more I think, strategically, in order for these companies to fulfill their social utility function, uh, in this case, as two women who are very, very committed to uh, dramatizing, reflecting issues experienced by women, uh, in their country and their region, there needs to be uh, an enabling economic climate um, to make sure that these SMEs are able to use their position at the forefront of cultural developments to reflect and dramatize those. And so they believe that there is no meaningful access without a meaningful uh, local audiovisual production capability, which actually not only is incidental uh, to what internet content can deliver in general, but is actually central to it. And therefore, the question of economic sustainability of their activities, the ability to offer people career tracks. These women are, have left potentially lucrative careers as, as engineers to devote themselves to audiovisual content. That needs to be factored into the ecosystemic equation when looking at the um, at the accessibility and certainly the meaningful access uh, component. I'll end by giving two examples of films that they recently made. One is called Empa Abi. It's the story of a young boy uh, who, after a difficult birth in a village in, in Uganda, develops uh, a, a condition, neurological condition, they, and he becomes neurodivergent, and the family hits against uh, local uh, incomprehension perhaps a deficit in knowledge about this type of conditions, and it's the story of how they try to address these issues and, and educate themselves and protect their sons and afford him a, a good childhood. Another one is um, about the story of a young woman who um, uh, rebels against the notion that having lost her husband in an accident, she by tradition is meant to, um, to marry the, the, the man's brother, and wants a different kind of uh, outcome for her life and to empower herself. So these are, are films that are really trying to dramatize things that people are living out every day. And they are utterly relevant to the meaningful access agenda that is being highlighted here. Perfect, thank you very much, Bertrand. Uh, this brings us finally to the content side that uh, we have neglected until now a little bit. Um, Roberto. You are monitoring, with the help of artificial intelligence, all the universe of the internet. So what's, what are the questions that come from the, the world? Everything together, yes. Uh, I think we have Carlos Afonso um, online. 
So if we need uh, his intervention, he will be ready to. Did he ask for the floor? Not yet. Not, not yet. Okay. Maybe for the section that we have for exchange, we can do that. Okay. And any question in the chat? Not no. any. Okay. Yet. So we can go to the question in the room. I see already one volunteer. Please introduce yourself and tell us straight the question. Okay. I'm Kosi. I'm a senior from Benin. I'm from Ministry of Economy and Finance in Benin. I have uh, two questions. Please. We are talking about access. Meaningful uh, access. Yeah, <laughs> but when we are talking about access, for me, we have two challenges. The first one is internet. Is it available or not? for us in our region in Africa. Sometimes we see the signal, but we don't get anything. What that mean? We are talking about video, film. They make some good thing in Kampala. What is the data? The data we collect there, what is it? In Africa? In which data center in Africa? We need to have our data in Africa. Everything we collect in Africa is supposed to be in Africa to be used for African people and for others. But when we collect it in Africa and put it in data center outside Africa and call African people to pay for internet bandwidth to collect that information after again is two way. We pay for the information you have is not normal. We supposed to make think very clearly, very open for everyone in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Onika, I think that this question is straight for you. Huh? So, um, well, thanks for, for raising that. Um, I think I won't respond specifically to the question, but I think what you are bringing is the fact that we have to also look at the financial model of how we are connecting everyone. Uh, we seem to have continued um, in an economy system that has essentially been very extractive without using this new opportunity of the internet to begin to correct some of those embedded inequalities that come with the existing uh, market structure. So I think as we look at developing access more, we have to be open and willing to look at different digital uh, technologies, but also be open to look at different fiscal mo financial models that will ensure that uh, we are actually developing uh, and innovating in the continent where we are building innovators and not just con content consumers uh, online. And I think what you are talking about is, is a discussion that's been going on within the region around uh, the region being able to keep its own data. And I think if we go back to the intervention I made on, smart, on, on affordability of phones, the reality is that the uh, minerals that are used to develop these smartphones actually come from the continent. Yet uh, Africa at the moment is spending as much as 40% for the cheapest um, smartphone that's available. So fixing the economy, I think, goes hand in hand with us being able to uh, participate equally in this digital transformation. Thank you. Who else want to add something on that? Um, Martin, you have statistics about data in Africa? How much data center exists? This kind of information will be available in your database? Well, th that's actually part of the of, of my second intervention, which is data gaps. Um, I don't want to make a spoiler, but... <laughs> yeah, no. We have recently been discussing um, middle connectivity. 
uh, and middle bowel connectivity indicators. And we're just developing a work program around it. So we don't have the indicators yet. We have indicators on bandwidth, which is, 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 is part of the issue here. Um, but how the data is channeled into data centers and, and how it comes to the, let's say, to the last mile, that is, that is part of the, the indicators that we are going to develop in the coming years, but we don't have any, not a lot of good solid indicators on that yet. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to get back to the minister, if possible, so that we can free him. He's still online with us. If he's online with us, the, the, the question that for him is now, he said that they are doing a lot of interesting things, including rugby, uh, but the problem is about the infrastructure, I guess. We, uh, for islands, states, uh, the problem of the infrastructure is a very big problem. Uh, are they using satellite? I would be curious to know more about the technical solution. Uh, thank you. Please confirm again if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in Papua New Guinea, our connectivity, I'd like to first say that um, be, uh, since the advent of uh, mobile network uh, coverage, we've sort of skipped the fixed line uh, era. And so we have much, much of the access coming from mobile network coverage. Uh, our current population uh, uh, coverage is around 76% uh, of population coverage, but uh, it's a mixed range between 2G, 2G 3G, and 4G. Uh, most of our growth rate is contributed to competition. And so there are two major interventions that we've made to make this happen. One is through, uh, through and of course, we are our, our open our, in our telecommunication, uh, retail, and wholesale space, we're guided by an open market uh, policy. And so we first had to uh, introduce as much competition as possible into the retail space to increase those numbers. Um, uh, the other aspect of, uh, of uh, connectivity, which I wanted, actually, I wanted to highlight, uh, if I may, that uh, because there were some comments on on affordability of devices. Sorry, I'm, I'm diverting to something slightly different. But, but uh, I also want to flag that in Papua New Guinea, uh, what we've noticed is uh, the threshold for affordable is around, uh, and, and these are mainly data coming from operators, uh, the cheapest affordable smartphone that, that, that we've been able to get out there is uh, ranging around uh, 60 US dollars. And uh, this is like stripped down smartphones that uh, have the basic smart capabilities. And we found that at $60 and downwards, there's a huge increase in, um, in uh, purchasing, purchasing power. And I think that uh, um, a combination of infrastructure, uh, infrastructure access plus affordable device uh, factors that should be uh, attributed in developing countries. Uh, you mentioned affordability of the devices. There is any policy in place in your country uh, to support the accessibility, uh, the affordability? Uh, we are currently looking at uh, next phase after introduction of our digital services. The next phase would be starting to look at how we can provide uh, Tax, uh, uh, tax uh, reduction incentives for devices, importing of devices. And uh, I think that would be the next phase, 20, 2020, uh, 2023, 2024, 2025. Um, that would be the next phase as we, you know, going back to meaningful connectivity, as we provide content and services, the next step would be to bring the cost of the devices further down. Thank you very much. And I give you a good news. Uh, Vint Cerf, uh, I asked him if he will be available to give a suggestion and advice. So if you want to ask uh, Vint something about affordability, we will bring the question to, to him and we will give you back the answer. 
Thank you for being with us. Uh, we know that you are busy. If you have to leave, um, we will apologize you. Don't worry. Okay, uh, we have another question from the room. Please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Dinesh. Uh, we have community networks near Bangalore in India. And I have kind of three questions. One is to the minister from Papua New Guinea. You said you have so many languages, and I'm fascinated by hearing that. And you said you have ideas on how to deal with bringing internet to these many languages. I want to hear about it in great detail, because that's the first time I hear that there is somebody working on languages. It's probably not literal. There is no you know, text for it. I'm just guessing. How are you dealing with it? Number two is to the Japanese minister. You have Japanese and English. You are dealing nicely. What are you doing with the others who are older, who need to, who need voice, who need content in uh, audiovisuals, mostly audio? And the third one is based on the African uh, comment. We have community networks. We have in India about a billion low literate people and it includes that, but what are we doing about technology, yes, internet, reaching to these people? That's, that's the meaningful accessibility for us. Thank you. And it's important to remember that you, are, you have one of the cases in the report that uh, is providing some solutions. So I suggest people to go to the report and to have a look at it. You want to make advertising for it? For I'm seconds? sorry? Do you want Shall to I? advertise for your project? Yeah. 30 okay. seconds? No, thank you. So you read it. Um, <laughs> so um, I think um, internet, firstly as a web, is all about hyperlinks. Hypertext it starts and it's you know, and internet has not gone further as standards and technology to reach non-text people, okay? How do you give, I mean, I can talk about it a lot, but how, we have to, as technology people, push this forward. And we are trying, but it can be like in a small thing, like it has to come together. And how do you do hyperlinks when you have media as a thing? And what is the internet in the small? Like if you are in a community network, how do you bring this within the community as a first class protocol based internet? Like a decentralized web is what I'm thinking, just to say it in one word. Thank you. Uh, I think that um, we, you can get some answers from the second round from the panel. Roberto, any? Sign on life from the universe? Yes. Uh, we have a comment from Carlos Afonso. He says a, ma a major challenge in universalizing connectivity, which may many digital inclusion programs forget, once a person is connected, he, she should stay connected. Many universal connectivity programs do not make sure persistence of connectivity together with quality is fundamental. A connected school or remote con community ought to be connected and stay connected. Thank you, Carlos, for these remarks. Perfect. That's, uh, we have the perfect example of Uganda. They were connected at the beginning of the session, and when it was their turn, they were not connected anymore. Okay. Um, before to make the second round, I remember that Martin wanted to bring in the discussion a point that is important just for memory, that is the IDN question. Can you take the floor, Martin? I remember that to the audience that last year, also with Roberto, we mentioned this as one of the points on which we need to improve. So, which are the last news from the front? Okay, my name is Martin Bottomon. Uh, Yes, on IDNs, indeed, uh, an important aspect is, of course, that they will be able to be used by people who don't uh, use the, the Latin script, as we call it, the letters we see above. Uh, and that may not be useful worldwide, but
But in particular, more and more, we see the internet also serves local communities. And maybe solutions can be found where they do resolve in local communities, maybe even faster before they resolve anywhere. It requires a lot of collaboration because the internet is a, a mess of a lot of different applications. Now, what we do with ICANN is uh, work on the IDN tables to make sure that addresses can be found. But the addresses also need to be found in the web browsers, in email addresses, in applications that, that, that support. So it requires quite an effort, and, and uh, we, we're very happy to facilitate that effort by also supporting the Universal Acceptance Steering Group, which in its work goes well beyond ICANN uh, as such. But uh, if you allow me, I'd like to, to make to, uh, another point here. Uh, other aspects of meaningful accessibility are also in power. Is there enough power? You see that's different in different parts of the world. And is in uh, affordability, as you rightly said. Uh, I must say India is in the uh, good position that at least mobile access is amazingly affordable compared to some other parts in the world, for instance in Africa, where if you have this mobile phone, it's very uh, expensive to use it. So it's also not thinking only in terms of is electricity there, is bandwidth there, but also is access affordable. Next to the uh, IDM point, if you allow me. Oh, please, thank you. Thank you very much. So Martin, do we can expect that um, for the next round of GTLDs, uh, there will be a push from ICANN about IDN? TLDs? I've, my expectation, and of course, it's the, the market who will come with proposals, but uh, we, we believe that this is an opportunity for, in particular, the next billion to be reached, and that next billion will need to have access to, to the non-Latin characters, and uh, we do what we can to support that uh, in that. So. <laughs> Inshallah, they say, in other parts of the world. Okay, thank you. Uh, this brings exactly to the point with our Japanese colleague. Uh, you, have, um, you see that the problem is seen in different ways in different parts of the world. Can you add something? Uh, yes, IDN. Um, well, remember IDN is just a piece of the uh, bigger problem. So um, I guess we should take care of other issues uh, issues other than IDN, but uh, uh, the problem we have with IDN in Japan uh, is like this. Uh, internationalized domain names in Japanese characters who are not well accepted locally. So we, many of us do not, or most of us do not use uh, internationalized domain name in Japanese characters. I don't quite remember any any of the major local websites identify themselves with IDN. I believe these websites have their names re registered uh, in IDN for protective or defensive reasons, but uh, that's about it. And um, for, for, for me, I don't know if this is true to others, but for me, it is comfortable to use Japanese characters for search strings rather than uh, for URLs or uh, identifiers. And uh, in, so when you write Japanese, you have to use a combination of the uh, alphabet and symbols and the Japanese uh, characters. So uh, if you want to use uh, IDNs, you have to uh, produce a combination of these scripts anyway. So, um, I mean, you have to use the Latin alphabet in any way. So, um, you have to switch back and forth between Japanese characters, the Latin alphabet, and other symbols. So, it's very cumbersome to use IDN in Japanese, uh, uh, in, in, in Japanese. So, uh, that's one issue. In, in addition, you can easily identify a URL in the Latin alphabet in an article 
written, written in Japanese because it just stands out, uh, uh, stands out the rest of the text. So it's easier for you to, you know, locate uh, URL from uh, written Japanese. So, um, and if, if the URL is written in IDN, maybe you maybe find it difficult to uh, find out where the URL is. So that's another uh, issue from a practical point of view. And well, actually, and when you write Japanese, you often switch from one script to another to emphasize a word or phrase uh, in the middle of a sentence uh, when you write Japanese uh, texts. So um, we are used to switch from the Latin alphabet to Japanese characters and to kanji. So um, we are quite used to using the alphabet for, for any purposes. So that may relate to the low take up of the IDN uh, in, 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 in thank, Japanese. Th this is my personal you, observation. Thank you, Professor. But the time is tyrant. We need to give the floor to the others. Um, may, may I add a little bit to that? Yes. So I, I, right. I really appreciate your experience. And, and, and Japan is a case where well-educated people have good access to computers and, 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 and manage to do what you say right now. Uh, when I think, and when uh, Giacomo asked about the longer term, I'm thinking of, indeed of the longer term where uh, we see part of the world where the mobile is the device, where it's more difficult to switch, and, and, and uh, also uh, a world in which we see that uh, increasingly voice commands will be taking over, etc. So I, I think for the longer term, we may not be... I, I, I remember I was used uh, to put my telephone on a, on a, on a modem, and, and, and that worked. But I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore. So, so I, I think you give an excellent example. Uh, but for the longer term, I think we can't avoid... Uh, people will earlier be able to yeah. learn an adapted internet than that everybody will uh, be able to use I think that, characters. I think that we will have to come back to you for uh, what we will write in the report. So we, we will need your help for the finalizing the report on this point. Thank you very much. So, Martin, please, we are very late, so if we can be short as much as possible. Uh, just to mention something that you have no time to mention, I will do for you. Uh, there is a pilot experience that you, ITU is doing with UNESCO in the Pacific area where we are combining data from your database and the UNESCO Rome indicators. That um, is a very interesting combination of uh, contents and access to uh, uh, and access in, from the technical viewpoint. But please complete your uh, presentation about uh, the statistics. Yes, in thank the you. Shortest possible time. I, I'll try to be short. Uh, I, m I mentioned the good news. We have a lot of data on universal and meaningful access and universal and meaningful connectivity, as we call it. This includes a lot of uh, data on, on prices, prices of internet packages, mobile packages, etc. There was a comment uh, before. I just want to say that we have a very rich data set on that. But the bad news is there's also a lot of data gaps. And that's partly because the data aren't there, partly because we, the data are there, but we are not uh, coordinated. We don't have access to the data. We don't have uh, we don't get the data from the source, or we don't have a partnership with the source. And, and that's something that we're working very hard on. For example, anything to do with speed measurement, actual speed measurements, uh, MLAB, UCLA, those kind of places. We need to continue working with them. Uh, handset devices is an area we are not yet working on, but we've had a lot of contact with the World Bank, with uh, what used to be A for AI before. And that's certainly work that needs to continue. Uh, we're working on, on big data, the, the power of big, big data to also be able to get a more granular view of what's happening in a country, within a country, within a community even. Um, we're working very hard on that. But very importantly, I mentioned digital divides, and digital divides is about 
people, you need to know who the people are who are using the internet and what they're using it for and who is not using. And still the best source for that is surveys. Surveys of people often run by a statistical office. And for that we have very good data from all the high income countries and not a lot of good data from low income countries simply because surveys are expensive. So policymakers who see the importance of data for achieving universally meaningful connectivity should also add funding statistical offices in their program. That's, that's fundamental. Onika, uh, how you can complement this experience? Uh, you can compete with the ITU in providing the collecting data? Yeah, I will just add one thing. Gender segregated data. Very important if we, are, if we stand a chance at closing the digital gender gap. Okay. But um, if, um, your report will um, can be seen as a complement of what ITU uh, provides. Yes, certainly. So we are actually currently in the process of collecting data on the cost of ex what we are calling the cost of exclusion, uh, looking to calculate the economic impact of excluding women from the digital economy, but also humanizing uh, that uh, experience by looking at qualitative research and ethnographic uh, studies to really be able to paint a picture and tell a story about what we are losing in our economies by not uh, being uh, inclusive in our digital development. Okay, remember that ITU Secretary General is a woman, so if you send to her then, then then she will ask Martin to look more in deep for the <laughs> Laurent, so are you scared about uh, what uh, our Japanese professor said, that um, domain name will be overpassed by search engines? Um, yeah, I mean, this is something, I mean, we, uh, we know. I mean, it's like, you know, using mobile phone now with, app with apps make, I mean, domain names uh, invisible. Uh, but um, <clears throat> this is not up to ICANN to, to say that and uh, to, to make a comment on that. I mean, we have, uh, in the context of a coalition, uh, we are working with the uh, um, Association of African Universities, and for them, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, if universities in Africa, I mean, uh, have some interest for IDN, for us, I mean, we will try to help them to develop universal acceptance in the continent, etc. So again, I mean, it's not up to ICANN to, to say that, uh, yeah, we don't need any more domain names or whatever. I mean, it's, uh, we are working with partners. We are trying to have, a, we are very humble in our approach. It's, uh, we are asking people what they need, and then we are trying to help them to, to, to bring them what they need, the support they need. This is what we are doing with all the, the, the tracks, all the initiative of this coalition. I mean, again, I mean, we are coming with, I mean, technical knowledge, expertise, expertise, and we are we are used to go through a need uh, assessment phase to, to better understand what they need. And at the end, I mean, the the, the different organizations, the different countries, it's up to them to decide where they want to go. We, we can just bring some expertise technical response to them. So I think that for these people, I mean, to come back to this, uh, to your question, I think for uh, some universities in Africa, it makes a lot of sense to have access to uh, domain names in local scripts. So let's say that it's still important. Thank you. Thank you. Maria. Yes, thank you. Well, I think in terms of data, I would only have to add to what Onika said, I think it is important to have disaggregated data, not just in terms of uh, sex, but also in terms of gender, because there's also uh, other minorities, for example, that are invisible to this, and there's not enough data on that. And But also, and talking about the context of libraries, uh, we also need better and more data in regard to what is the amount of libraries, for example, that are connected, currently connected to the internet, and from that amount of libraries, also maybe better indicators to assess uh, inside which of those facilities there's a meaningful access to information. So I think that that is something that I could also add in that sense. 
And, and maybe also adding a bit to what my colleague uh, Don mentioned before in terms of policies, uh, something that we also observe and think that could be useful would be to, to consider mentioning libraries explicitly in, um, in, in policies, digital cooperation policies, but also digital inclusion policies. Uh, because very often the term libraries really gets buried under the term of public access facilities. And this is something that really makes uh, libraries invisible at a higher policy level. So this is, this is also something to, to take into account. And, and also finally, just, just to add, it is also important to notice that the public access infrastructure development initiatives uh, should also really include a skilling of staff to run and also to facilitate digital inclusion and capacity building initiatives at a local level. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Now I have to ask for some patience because we ask to free people in the room, free distinguished friends of us, to listen carefully to what has been said and to tell us the feedback about what they retain as the most interesting points that we can include in the report. So, can we start with uh, Jane, that I see is ready to, to tell us? Just a few minutes of patience. Um. Beep, beep. Yeah. Yes, I'll be very brief. Um, one, solving the connectivity gap will take a multi-stakeholder approach, much like the PNMA itself, and our panelists here today, and the great speakers we've heard. Problems are being solved through coalitions, to regulatory and policy making from Papua New Guinea to Bena to help balance out markets. Changes need to be made to ex uh, to, from extractive only policies. Data must be gathered to identify gaps. ITU, ICANN and others are doing this um, to help us look at better solutions to identify what those gaps are. Partnerships are key and innovative financing approaches need to be made to support and build networks including CCTLDs and data centers. Thank you very much, Jane. This was about connectivity and about digital inclusion. Carlos Rey Moreno. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I feel a lot of the discussion today has been about digital inclusion, and many topics have been touched upon, the universal acceptance and everything that has to do uh, about people uh, being able to communicate with the scripts that uh, are other than Latin, should be able to, to do it online, and it's not only about IDNs, but many other hardware and software elements. Uh, a lot of discussions around a purpose-driven uh, content, uh, supporting the production as well as the distribution of um, relevant content, uh, e-governance services, as this, such as in the case of Papua New Guinea and cultural relevant services elsewhere. A lot of discussions in relation to that about incentives, funding that you may go and talk to Paolo about, as well as uh, sustainability of those content producers. Um, as well as an outreach campaign to, 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 to understand and to, to make people aware that this is possible. Also, the comment from Laurent about the importance of having a strong national CCTLDs to develop the, 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 the digital economy and include people that might be related to using uh, country-level uh, domains. In the importance of cyber security, although it hasn't been pointed out, there is a lot of elements around digital inclusion that have to be with cyber security in the context of, for instance, a technology facilitated gender-based violence and all the work and all the policies that are required in that front. Um, accessibility, all the projects from WIPO around uh, making uh, books uh, inclu uh, available for, for blind people, and some discussions all ra also around fostering innovation at the local level. I mean, we heard Dines, but we've been hearing others the importance about how local people can actually come up with their own decisions, and this conversation about meaningful access and meaningful connectivity shouldn't be uh, an only top-down one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos, very useful and very bright and appropriate comments. So now about capacity development, Margaret will give us uh, her hints. Thank you, Chair. A highlight for on capacity building that uh, technical skills are needed to understand emerging technologies and make them address and offer solutions. Training of trainers on digital skills is critical uh, and with this localization of this training to address local needs. 
Technical capacity support for internet registries is already happening through the project Digital Africa. Digital skills are needed to ensure quality of services and address cybersecurity challenges. We need a holistic approach on capacity building to ensure that we are addressing the needs that are needed. Our statistics are needed to determine skills needed for meaningful access and use. I know I've repeated myself there. Then uh, there was discussions around hyperlinks and how they can be used to address issues of language and uh, Japanese characters, and a study has been detailed that is part of the report. Again, uh, it was said that internet is a mess of a lot of applications and, and diverse digital skills are needed, and that is about it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, very useful. Please, if you can send us your notes uh, will be very useful because we have to produce very quickly a, re a first report and uh, what you say are perfectly making the picture. Uh, Roberto, there is life from the uni in the universe or they already went to sleep? Actually, there is one more comment from Stephen, but he wants us to read it and it says, a great interventions from other participants on the need to increase production on local audio and video content. This is a key intervention Papua New Guinea is taking note of and uh, should take to improve meaningful connectivity across more than 800 languages and cultures. Thank you. Thank Steve. you very much. Okay, so we are on my Swiss passport, I have to say that uh, I've not been good because I'm two minutes over. But on my Italian passport, having only two minutes delay, I am a, a lot better than the usual performance. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank all the participants here, uh, all the speakers, and especially uh, Daphne. Can you stand up, please, Daphne? <laughs> Thank you. And Roberto that volunteered the last moment as usual to, to support us and all the speakers and all the participants. Thank you very much. I see that Julian is here. Too late. We, we are already <laughs> closed. But um, your session, please send me uh, the conclusion and we will include in the report. We will hyperlink. Sorry, the hyperlink <laughs> we will put in the report because what you said in, in the session earlier today was very important and relevant for us. Thank you very much to everybody for the passions. Goodbye.